All right. Awesome. Great. Happy morning. Happy Tuesday morning, everybody. It's August 11th. My name is Eric Johnson, broker owner of Gator Commercial Real Estate and your 2020 Realtors Commercial Alliance president for Broward, Palm Beach, and St. Lucie counties. Nicole Messer of City Construction and Development is co-hosting this webinar, and she is serving as your 2020 CCIM president for the Broward District. Before we mute our lines, I ask you all to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. flag. The United States of America. United States of America. And to the Republic, to the Republic, the Republic for, for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, 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 with liberty and justice for all. All right. Let's get down to the business of getting down now. Please make sure your lines are muted, everybody. And please be respectful of your colleagues joining today. As they always say, we have varying socioeconomic, religious, political, et cetera, perspectives. To keep that in mind, uh, I want to say special thanks to our RCA and CCIM teams for helping coordinate today's and especially for Michael Chavez for um, with Champions Commercial Consulting for, for lending his here today. It was so kind of Michael to share his day with us so we can SEC football and, and more specifically expectations for the number eight preseason ranked program for a whole hour with you all. Personally, I'm okay with the all SEC schedule, especially as we add the Razorbacks to see how Felipe Franks will play against his former squad. Although I'll miss that cream puff matchup against Florida State. It kind of feels like the return of sports has helped ease tension for many folks out there, me included. Hopefully those involved can help manage all the goings on with a plum and keep everyone safe. Do you know who else can help manage us through this? A Gator who can share knowledge about property taxes in our markets. Remember the old normal? There were several tax advantages for owning real estate. An owner, user, or an investor, whether it be a client we represent or ourselves, can benefit from these provisions. Typically, this would be done so with savings on interest and depreciation expense, capital gains, and, and non-mortgage related things like renovations and maintenance. However, it will be difficult for the municipalities we live, work, and play not to consider passing at least some of the burden of their lost revenues on a commercial property owners. And what does that mean? Maybe it runs downhill, whereas it passes through to a tenant that's already struggling with expenses and increases the cost of the products and services. So if you're underwriting an investment property, should this be important to you? Is it just a blip on the radar? Will COVID even affect this year or will we see it next year? And for how many years after that might we need to adjust our valuation methods uh, to be a determining factor for the highest and best use of a property? Is there something we can do to counter it? I know we're here to talk commercial, but what if we're just trying to figure out a budget for our household? Property insurance is expected to increase for some, and should we also expect property taxes to follow suit? Let's see what Michael has to say right after we see what you have to say. We're going to try something new here. We're getting in the 21st century. Uh, we're going to try and take a poll. Belinda, if you could please open that up so everybody can see. Uh, this poll will be on property taxes on commercial real estate in South Florida. Do you expect them to increase, decrease, or say the same? Please mark your select on the screen and we will share uh, the results with you in just a couple of minutes. After Michael has completed his presentation, there'll be time for Q&A before we get into our property haves and wants marketing session. Be sure to think of him when you're working on something going forward to become a mutually beneficial resource. We'll get his info to you. I encourage you to reach out and uh, let's see, you'll be able to ask questions in the, and share comments via the chat bar or the Q&A button. Belinda, Nicole, or I will address them. If you know somebody you think would value a call like this, invite them to, to join. Send a, a message to Blender I or anyone at the CCIM and, and we'll get them some instructions to, to log in. For the next meeting, save the date. We're gonna skip a week um, or a bye week, I guess, but September 8th, 10 a.m., mark your calendars because we'll be Zooming with auctioneer and RCA member Casey Daniel. And uh, if you're lucky, it might just sound like this. I'm at 500 and I want 555 to bet on 550. I'm at 500, would you go 550, 550? <laughs> and there will be a vote on whose slang is cooler, the auctioneer <laughs> chant and filler talk or my native Midwestern mumble draw. Be on the lookout for an invitation to sign up, but now here's Nicole for any housekeeping points she'd like to address and to introduce you to today's speaker. Take it away, Nicole. Good morning. So happy to be here with you all. Thank you. Uh, Mike for uh, joining us this morning. Mike Chavez is the owner broker of Champion Commercial Consulting 
a licensed full service brokerage firm with a specialty in property tax mitigation. They service uh, the markets from Miami Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, Orlando, Tampa, and St. Lucie counties. Mike was the commercial division director for the Miami Dade property, uh, the commercial division director and the condominium division director for the Miami Dade County Property Appraiser's Office. So if you look at the Miami skyline, it'll give you a clear idea of the types of properties Mike has worked with. Mike has also served as an expert witness and represented the county in mediation. Welcome, Mike Tavis. We are so excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much. Nicole, thanks for the introduction. Let me go ahead and transfer to the share the screen here. Okay, then I'll stop sharing mine and you can go ahead. All right, let's uh, get this out of the way here. Okay, share a screen. Mm. All right, can everybody see this? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, first thing, Nicole, thanks for the introduction. Eric and Belinda, thank you for the opportunity. Good morning, everybody, fellow RCA members. Uh, I hope everyone is well, staying safe and healthy. Uh, I am Mike Chavis, the broker owner of Champions Commercial Consulting. Uh, we are located in St. Lucie West. Today we'll be discussing the 2020 notice of proposed property taxes. This is also known as a TRIM notice, T-R-I-M, a truth and millage notice. So if you go to a property appraiser's office and say, you know, I, I have my trim notice, they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Today, I wanted to present an overview of the assessment process. We'll cover a lot of material and there's a lot of detail. So for the sake of time, I do wanna stay on track. So if you have any questions, we can save them for the end. I wanted to present this information to the RCA for a couple of reasons. One, it's timely. Uh, the trim notices are mailed in August. So all Florida property owners should be receive, receiving their trim notice uh, shortly. Uh, so it's either you've received it already, it's either in the mail or it's about to be mailed. So this is something that all property owners uh, in Florida can expect to be receiving by mail. Uh, two, uh, I've been to many presentations by county property appraisers and they're all great. Uh, but their presentations tend to be geared towards a residential audience uh, with a focus on the homestead exemption process. This type of community outreach is necessary, informing new residential property owners of a tax benefit they may be entitled to receive. But today we have a commercial audience. I'll pre present a commercial perspective of the assessment process. Let's see here. As Nicole mentioned, Champions Commercial Co uh, Consulting is a licensed full service brokerage firm. Our specialty is property tax mitigation. All right, so I'm gonna start this off by throwing it back at the audience with the question, how many constitutional officer positions are there in the state of Florida? This is just background. Don't everybody answer all at the same time. Uh, the answer is five, five constitutional officers in the state of Florida. Why is that important? Uh, what are the five position titles of the question number two of the constitutional officers? Don't everybody answer all at the same time. Florida constitutional officers are the sheriff, property appraiser, tax collector, clerk of the court, supervisor of elections. These are all pretty much uh, elected positions. Now each constitutional office, officer is duly sworn to uphold, uphold the Florida constitution and statutes. In the state of Florida, there are 67 counties. E each county has its own set of five elected constitutional officers. There's a, there is an exception in Miami-Dade, 
the, uh, the property appraiser is elected, the clerk of the court is elected, but the tax collector, supervisor of elections, and the police uh, head, it, the, those are appointed positions, but that will change in 2024. <clears throat> Florida property appraisers are governed by the Florida Constitution, Florida <laughs> statutes, administrative rule, and case law. Uh, here right now, uh, what we have on screen is a Florida statute. Now, if anybody have ever asked themselves, and I'm sure this question comes up all the time, why do the property appraisers have to assess their properties as of January 1st of every year? Who says that? Well, you know who says that? It's a statute, 192.042. It talks about specifically the date of assessment. And it says all property should, shall be assessed according to its just value. Uh, let's keep that just value in mind for a little bit and we'll address that a, a little further down. So this statute talks about uh, real property shall be assessed according to its just value on January 1st of each year. Also, Section 2 talks about tangible personal property being assessed on January 1st of this year. Tangible personal property is also referred to as TPP. Uh, on the commercial side of it, it's called the Furniture, Fixtures, and Equipment, FF&E. &E, and there are, they do get assessed separately from the real property. Also in the statute, without getting into a whole lot of detail, it talks about improvements or portions not substantially completed as January 1st, as of January 1st, shall have no value placed on thereon. So what this is talking about is new construction. If your new construction is not substantially complete as of January 1st, it will not be assessed. Typically, new construction is assessed the following year in which it is, uh, is completed, substantially completed. So if it's completed this year in 2020, it will be assessed the following year in 2021. And that's a whole big area to discuss too. It's, it's, we can save that for another conversation. Okay, another statute. Now this is a, a big one, uh, 193.011. Factors to consider in deriving just valuation. Here we hear just valuation again. In arriving at just valuation, the property appraiser shall take into consideration the following factors. So what this is saying is the property appraiser needs to consider these factors when deriving just valuation. Now, the, another question out to the audience is, how many factors are there? Well, the answer is eight. <clears throat> uh, the first one here, uh, the factor to consider in, in arriving at just valuation uh, is actually kind of an interesting one because it talks about uh, the amount a willing purchaser would pay a willing seller exclusive of reasonable fees and costs. And I, Belinda, I, I'm getting cut off here on the right side here, but, uh, but it talks about a, a transaction at arm's length. So this is talking about that the property appraiser must consider arm's length transactions, uh, sales uh, in developing their values. But more importantly, it says here that they are to exclude now, one of the things that these factors tell the property appraisers is what they can consider, and it also tells them what they sh should not consider. And here, it talks about the amount of, of a willing purchaser would pay a willing seller for a property, but exclusive of reasonable fees and costs of purchase. So what that means is, let's say for a very a simplistic example, we have a sale of a house for a $100,000, it, it sells but the purchaser has additional expenses to that transaction uh, that they expended uh, to consummate this, this, this deal. So they may have paid for an appraisal, they may have paid for a survey, they may have paid for points, they may have paid for other things as part of this transaction. And what this is telling the property appraisers is, is that they are not to consider those costs of purchase. So let's say for example, it sold for 100,000, but the purchaser spent $5,000 in in purchasing fees, closing costs. This tells the property appraiser says, listen, you gotta look at the 100,000 and you're not supposed to look at it as a $105,000 transaction. Pretty much needs to, it goes without saying, but at least they, they specify it here. Uh, number two, highest and best use analysis. Uh, this is something that the 
property appraisers need to consider in their valuation as well. Uh, and what this gets into, if you look at a site area and what the zoning is, uh, what the zoning allows, the underlying land use, what that allows. Uh, and then you have to decide what use for this property is the, the maximally productive, the most uh, profitable use that this property can be put to. Now, there are cases just because it's zoned commercial doesn't necessarily mean commercial is the best use. I've seen cases where a site was zoned commercial, but the owner decided to build apartment buildings because there was demand there and it was allowed under zoning. So you have to look at the most profitable use and uh, the use that it has a lot of demand for. The location of said property, number three, they have to consider, you know, is it a front lot? Is it fronting a commercial corridor? Is it a back lot? Does it have poor access? Uh, the quantity or size of said property, this gets into units of measure. You know, how many acres is it? What is the leasable area? How many apartment units are there? Do they have the property appraisers have the correct breakdown of the, the unit mix? The one ones, the two twos, the three twos. Uh, on the hotel side, uh, do they have the correct unit uh, units for the hotel rooms, uh, the number of rooms? So the quantity has to be accurate on the property appraisal side, side and this is a huge undertaking. Number five, the cost of said property. They have to, the property appraisers have to consider the cost of said property in their valuation. So uh, this lends itself to the, like the cost approach. Number six, the condition of said property. Generally with mass appraisal, uh, the underlying assumption is that everything is in average condition. So if you're in great condition, uh, you might be assessed a little bit more than everybody else. If you're in poor condition, uh, you should be assessed a little bit less than everybody else. Number seven, a big one. The income from said property. The property appraisal's office must consider the income from said property. And number eight, which uh, is often used a lot, is the net proceeds of the sale as received by the seller after deduction of all the usual, usual reasonable fees and cost of sale. So what that talks about, and this is where the, really a difference between the property appraiser's assessment valuation versus a private fee appraiser's valuation is the property appraiser has to look at the net proceeds to the seller. What does that mean? So if a property sells for $100,000, like in the example we gave before, and there's a, a real estate commission of 6%, and there's other costs of, uh, of sale from the seller, that has to be deducted uh, and reflected in the assessment. It's kind of a big one, so it's, it's important to know. And then also it's, it talks about the property appraisers for the purposes of such determination shall, shall exclude any portion of the proceeds attributable to payments for household furnishings or other items of personal property. Uh, I had a case in uh, Las Olas, uh, bought a house fully loaded with furniture. Uh, that was included in the purchase price. And the property appraisers are not supposed to consider that when they look at the sale price. Okay. All right, uh, here is a landmark court case. Now, what happens is, uh, one, one of the things that we learn is that the court cases help interpret the law. A lot of times there may be a dispute, and I've read a lot of these statutes, they're kind of nebulous, and they're not really clear. And so in this case here, this is a Florida Supreme Court ruling back in 1965, and it still holds true today. And apparently there, there was a case here where talking about just value, a property owner said, hey, you know, they went to court, said my just value is this. The property appraiser said my just value, the, pro the just value is this, and there was a big difference. And, and they couldn't come to terms on it, so they went to court, and the court decided that just value is synonymous with fair market value. So if you go to a property appraiser's office and you ask them what my value is, what kind of value do you place on my property? They should tell you fair market value. And I, and I believe they do. Uh, but I just want to make something clear. It's, it's fair market value. It's not market value. It's not 100% market value. So that's something to keep in mind. So they assess at fair market value. The property appraiser's office, uh, 
they use a valuation technique called mass appraisal. Uh, the mass appraisal is the valuation of a universe of properties within their jurisdiction, within their county. They have to account for all those parcels and they have to value all those parcels every year. It is a challenge. As the eight criteria factors we talked about earlier, uh, the, the mass appraisal process employs three recognized appraisal approaches to value. We saw that they have to look at the sale, they have to look at the cost, they have to look at the income. And each of those approaches to value generate their own independent value, but the, in the end, the property appraiser has to reconcile the three approaches and come up with a final estimate of value. Everybody's familiar with this, the valuation methodologies. We talked about the uh, looking at sales. Uh, this is the principle of substitution which is fundamental to this approach, which means that it's, the logic is, is that buyers will look at comparable properties for sale before they bid and purchase a property. And so it's assuming that the buyer is an educated buyer and that the sale price is a result of uh, the marketplace. In developing assessed values, recent comparable sales are analyzed by the property appraiser's office. Since all properties are not the same, value adjustments are made to the sale properties to account for differences between the sales and the subject property. If the subject property was a 3-1, let's say, and all the comps are 3-2s, the sales, those sale prices have to be adjusted downwards to reflect that uh, of a 3-1. Cost approach. Uh, this method examines the cost to replace the property structures from the ground up. Remember the number six factor talked about the cost of the said property. Generally, it entails developing a replacement cost new for all the structures. Then you have to calculate depreciation or obsolescence for the subject property, and then it is deducted from the replacement cost new, leaving a depreciated value of the structure and site improvements. Then what you do is you add the land value to the depreciated value of the structure and site improvements, and you come up with your cost value. Income approach. Generally, this is most appropriate for income producing properties. It's based on the financial concept of the present worth of future benefits as it relates to income streams. An income analysis usually is uh, by the property appraiser's office is an income model and is prepared for the subject property, which considers the annualized market rents, occupancy levels, operating expenses, NOI, and a market-based cap rate. And then this generates an income-based value as you all are familiar with. This is RCA discussion now. Uh, we're gonna look at the, the comps, right? The direct sales comp comparison approach. Pros, recent sales are usually good indicators of market value. Now, in a residential scenario, uh, in a neighborhood, uh, a lot of this track housing, uh, they tend to be homogeneous. Uh, you have a lot of good uh, sales and it really lends itself on the residential side for uh, the direct sales comparison approach. Uh, the con of the direct sales comparison approach on the commercial side is in smaller urban markets, recent comparable sales may be limited. As such, a regional search for comparable sales is needed. So if I'm in a smaller county and I'm looking for, let's say, golf course sales, I may have to go out to other counties or even further statewide to look for comps. Sales verification is needed when you're looking at comparable sales. What does that mean? It means you can't take a sale price, recorded sale price at its face value. Uh, you know, was it exposed to the open market or was it just a, a percentage interest transfer, uh, intracorporate transaction? Was it a foreclosure? Was it a sale leaseback? Were intangibles included? This is very important when you're looking at your comparable sales and the property appraisers office has to be able to, they have a sales verification team and they have to be able to uh, discern all this information. As you all are, are aware, CoStar is a, a subscription-based commercial sales database. Uh, most property appraiser websites have a sales search application. It's powerful and useful. However, the data is raw and limited to their county. So let's say, for example, on CoStar, you may get some information like, uh, you know, the listing agent or, or the buyer's agent with contact information. You may get marketing material. You may get uh, floor plans. Uh, that you will not find from the property appraiser's sales website, although it's a real good source of sales. The cost approach, RCA discussion. 
Uh, typically best for special use type properties, silos, aircraft hangars, churches, stadiums, auditoriums. Uh, these are special unique type of properties that there's really not much of a, a market for and uh, you might have to rely on the cost approach. The cons, the property appraiser may not be aware of specific physical conditions as it relates to your property. Does it have a leaking roof, foundation settlement, deferred maintenance? These are things that the property appraiser may not be aware of. Uh, the property appraiser may not be aware of economic or functional issues directly affecting property. The lack of parking, the, the land to building ratio, the obsolete design, an over improvement, an under improvement. Uh, building orientation, does it have an outward focus? Does it have an inward focus? Uh, is there active road construction preventing the customers from getting to your property? <clears throat> depreciation and obsolescence. Depreciation and obsolescence, these are difficult to measure. You know, typically you have with depreciation, you have a straight line and a age life method. Uh, typically for improvements, these are uh, they are generally, just for example, given an economic life. Uh, let's give, say it's a given a 50-year economic life. It's not physical life, it's economic life. Now, with a straight line de depreciation, it would be like, for 50 years, it'd be like 2% a year, till at the end of 50 years, the value of the improvements are zero. Pretty much straight line. And you'll see this with tax returns and, and things like that. Uh, age life method uh, still kind of assumes that 50 year economic life for the structure. However, what you'll find is rather than straight line, you'll find more of a parabolic curve where it kind of flattens the depreciation at the top when it's new, it depreciates very little, then it starts dropping off and then it starts flattening out with some sort of residual value. Now in a 50 year life, you know, today's 2020, we're going back to 1970. Of course, between 1970 and 2020, if there's any upgrades or renovations uh, to the property, modernization, uh, this will uh, extend its economic life. And then we have to ask the question, do buyers really consider the cost to replace existing improvements in their purchasing decision? That's a question mark. Marshall and Swift is a subscription-based commercial cost estimating service and is considered the industry standard. The application requires training and skill. Here we go, RCA discussion, income approach. Most applicable to commercial properties. If available to the property appraiser, actual market rents should be considered with rent rolls, leases, operating statements. However, that's very difficult for the property appraisers to get that information for every single commercial property. So if not, uh, if actual income is not available or if it's owner occupied, uh, the property appraisal will use market proxy rents and they will be imputed. So they'll do their market studies, find out what rents are, what leases are going for, and they'll just uh, impute a market rent, a proxy rent. They'll also come up with stabilized vacancy rates, rent loss, operating expenses, and cap rates will also be imputed if they don't have actual income. The con to the income approach is that from the property appraiser's office, imputed rental income and vacant vacancy levels may not accurately reflect subjects operating performance. RCA discussion notes, for investors, the income approach is the most relevant indicator of value. And I know that is true on the commercial side. It all, most of uh, the marketing brochures I'll see will say, hey, it's an 8% cap rate, it'll give you this. So everybody's familiar with the income approach to value. And more importantly, it's based on the premise of present worth of future benefits, income streams. This is key uh, for the 2020 assessment. Why? Because what happens is most property appraisers use a direct capitalization uh, approach to value. And what this assumes is, a, a, the concept assumes a stabilized income into perpetuity. So after year one, okay, the present worth of future benefits, January 1st, 2020, what they'll be doing is projecting income at the end of 2020, income at the end of 2021, and so on down the line. And it's stabilized. So the question then is, so as of January 1st, 2020, if the first year's and potentially second year income is significantly disrupted by a global pande pandemic causing an unstable market, shouldn't this be considered in the property appraiser's income approach? 
I'm just leaving that as a question. Uh, there's, uh, remember, they have that, that hard date, January 1st, that they have to base their value on. However, uh, a lot of the cost approach information, a lot of the sales information is historic. Uh, however, I think they should also be considering trends. Trends, <clears throat> market disruption, COVID-19, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. March 9th, 2020, declared a state of emergency for the entire state of Florida for COVID-19. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. You know, this is March 9th, and we're looking at January 1st, 2020. Uh, I think what the, this COVID uh, be became uh, international news in December of 2019. March 17th, 2020, uh, Governor Ron DeSantis ordered all bars and nightclubs to close for 30 days. March 17th, seven, St. Lucie and Indian River counties declared a state of emergency. This other executive order, 2094, which has been extended, uh, it's getting a lot of press lately, to uh, September 1st. And this is the moratorium, the freezing of evictions and foreclosures. I see this as the, the next shoe to drop, but with the extension that the governor just made to September 1st, one of the things that he excluded, as I read, was that commercial businesses and commercial loans, uh, excuse me, commercial uh, business loans and, and commercial mortgages are exempt from the, the moratorium. The moratorium, for the foreclosure moratorium only applies to residential properties. And if anybody's got more information on that, that'd be great. Uh, and then the declaration of state of emergency has been extended a couple times. And the last one was extended July 7th for another 60 days. That takes us out to September 7th, 2020. And I would say it's likely that it will be extended again. Uh, press release, uh, St. Lucie County. Uh, the uh, St. Lucie County taxable value, this is from the property appraisers office, increases six and a half percent taxable value for the 2020. Now, uh, in all fairness, uh, St. Lucie County is more of a bedroom community and there is a lot of active construction in the tradition in Southern Groves area. And a lot of that new construction uh, accounts for uh, the increase here at six and a half percent. We talk about the trim notice in the mail, the truth and millage, uh, the mailed notices informing property owners of the 2020 proposed assessment, taxes and special assessments. List each taxing authority's proposed 20 millage rates, 2020 millage rates. It also indicates critical deadlines to contest your assessment and millage rates. The notice of proposed property taxes also encourages property owners to have qu who have questions about their 2020 assessment to call or visit their office. In St. Lucie West, and uh, maybe Jeff can uh, help me out with this, but uh, there are three standalone restaurants that have closed within close proximity to each other. And, and for example, this one here is a Friday's. Now this Friday's was struggling before the pandemic. And I think the pandemic, all it did was accelerate the trend. You'll hear that often, the uh, accelerating the trend, the pandemic. Now, the reason I took a picture, first thing, this Friday's is closed. Second thing, there's a sticker on the window here, this yellow sticker. And of all things, it says that notice of pending levy and seizure do not remove, and it's for failing to pay their tangible personal property taxes. So all the, the furniture and fixtures and equipment that are in there, the chairs, the tables, the cash registers, the, the ovens, the freezers, the dishwashers, all that is tangible personal property. And the fact that it, they did not pay and this would have to be last year's tax bill is not a good sign for this Friday's going forward. This, uh, I think this Friday is going to be permanently closed and it does not have a drive through. Here's another standalone restaurant in St. Lucie West. And uh, this was formerly known as a, a friendlies. And as you can see, it is now for sale. It is a standalone restaurant no drive-through, and their menu really did not lend itself to curbside delivery or, or delivery services. This is like a family ice cream parlor. 
and you know no one's gonna order a, a shake uh, to be made and delivered to the house by the time I guess they're really melted uh, and they were also struggling prior to the pandemic and this just accelerated the trend and across the street there's also a another uh, standalone restaurant a Ruby Tuesdays that is closed also I don't know if it's permanent or temporary but the only thing I can think of is that that open salad bar concept with this COVID right now is uh, can't be a good thing. <clears throat> this is all public record. This is a the 29 notice of proposed property taxes for that Friendly's restaurant that we just saw with a sign out front. Front, and one of the things that uh, I that is interesting about commercial property, most commercial property is owned by folks that are outside of the, the county or out of town or out of state. So although this property, this is the tax notice, 2019 tax notice for friendlies, you'll see it's owned by a group here out of Miami in Brickell. So this is a, that's the ownership. So this is a sample notice. I'll just go for it, go through it real quick. Uh, it lists all the taxing authorities here and there's a bunch of them. The column one, the, the, what the trim notice does, truth and millage, it tells you what your taxes were last year. Column two tells you what your taxes would be if the taxing authorities do a rollback rate, which basically means that they're, they will all opt to uh, operate at the same budget level as in the previous year. No increases or so on. It's uh, idealistic, but uh, it's just a point of reference. Column three is more realistic. This is what your proposed taxes are this year if the budget changes are made, and it's usually more. Also on the side here, if you wanna contest your, uh, the millage rates or the, uh, the spending of the, the taxing authorities, uh, it gives you dates and times where you can go and attend a hearing and, and express yourself. At the bottom of the notice, <clears throat> uh, we'll go to the column three, you'll see the property taxes are $20,000 total property taxes. But as you come down a little further, we have something called these non ad valorem assessments. In Miami, it, it was we used to call them the uh, special taxing districts, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, over here, it's non ad valorem assessments. Uh, but you can see that is in to the tune of about $10,000 on top of the $20,000 in real estate taxes. So if you add them up, the total ad valorem taxes and non ad valorem assessments are $30,000. Uh, just so that you know, uh, when you go to the property appraiser's office, the, the, the type of errors that can exist are errors in fact, computational, mathematical calculation type errors, uh, where you know maybe someone got a fat finger uh, or that it's uh, hit the wrong key. Or if you have a survey and it shows my uh, lot size as being 100 by 100, 10,000 square feet, and the property appraiser is showing your lot is 150 by 100, uh, with your evidence of the survey, uh, it should be corrected. That's a error in fact. Judgment, I don't really wanna call this an error, but there's an old saying that the, the more information you have, uh, the better your decision-making process will be. And uh, if the property appraiser receives additional information that it did not have before to consider, it's possible they can make a change in the value, either administratively at the value adjustment board or through court. And the other one is a material mistake of fact. Uh, this is a significant occurrence that the PA was not aware of around January 1st. So if a property burnt down as of January 1st and you have a fire report and the property appraiser wasn't aware of it, this is material information. Uh, also, and contamination kind of falls into this group also, where if there is a, uh, a gas station and there are underground storage tanks and there's leaks, uh, there's soil contamination. Uh, this is information the property appraiser may not be aware of. And if it exists, you know, you may want to bring it to their attention. The value adjustment board, uh, the appeal process. Uh, if you or your client, client truly believe that your property tax assessment is overstated, be prepared to produce evidence. Uh, if you contest your assessment, make sure you're prepared to t discuss it. Now, let me say this, uh, during the trim period after the notices are mailed out, the property appraisal's office are open for like 25 days, N not straight, but you know, I mean, they take the holidays off, uh, the weekends off. 
But if you go there and inquire about your property, you know, if you want to say, how did you arrive at my property's value? The property appraiser's office should be able to provide you comps, the sales they used, and if they use an income, evalu income valuation method, they should also give you the income worksheet that they did, assuming there's no confidential information on there, their pro forma worksheet. And then what, with that information, you can take it home and review it and decide whether or not that you feel that your property is over assessed. Uh, if an assessment is controversial or complex, I advise clients to file a VAB appeal this process provides more time to figure out and review your 2020 20 assessment and if needed, gather further documentation for assessment reduction presentation. Concerns for 2020. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the disconnect right now because of what we're going through. Uh, the ability of property owners to visit government offices in person, the interaction. Uh, not everyone has a computer access, nor is everyone proficient in video conferencing. Uh, my concern is a lot of the discussions with the property appraisers because of this COVID, uh, it's gonna have to be done over the phone. It's kind of impersonal and I hope everybody gets a fair shake that way. Uh, it's best to resolve cases directly with the property appraiser's office. However, the six foot distancing and mask mandates uh, will likely alter the tr normal trim and VAB practice of conducting in-person conferences and hearings. So if there's a VAB hearing, uh, I'm assuming that this year it will be done by video conferencing, which is going to be a lot different. And it's, I can't help but think that you're going to miss something in the process of making your presentation. And that's it. <laughs> Awesome, Michael. Thanks. Go Gators. All right. So what, uh, that is a lot that is complex. Um, Michael, there, there was a question that was asked that poll earlier on, on what do people expect? What direction do we expect property taxes to go for, for, for commercial uh, properties we were looking at or represent what, um, I mean, obviously the answer is it depends. Could, would you mind diving into this a quick and dirty minute or so response to that? Right. You think so it adjusts maybe by, by property type or by a certain time period? What are you thinking? All right, there's a couple things. Uh, there's nothing legislatively that's come down to the property appraisers to direct them to make adjustments for COVID. Uh, that hasn't happened that I'm aware of. Uh, however, on the other side of the equation, the millage rates and the, the special taxing authorities or the, 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 yeah, the taxing authorities, they will probably, you'll probably see some millage increases on the property tax side uh, because uh, of all the expenses a lot of these cities and, uh, and counties have gone through uh, dealing with COVID and ramping up their offices, buying laptops for staff, uh, and so on, uh, improving their technology. So I, I really do see millage rates going up. Uh, what's going to happen on the commercial side? I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's the January 1st date, January 1st, 2020 date, with, uh, when you start doing an income valuation based on actual income. I think that could uh, change things a little bit, but it all depends on the property appraiser and how flexible they are. And uh, I know in Miami-Dade County with Pedro Garcia, uh, his office is in downtown Miami, and he's gone on the record a couple times to say that he will do everything within his authority to help property owners, commercial property owners. Why? Because he's, he looks at downtown Miami every day and everything is in lockdown. Tenants have vacated. Uh, it's quiet. Uh, there's no action. Uh, it's, it's hard to say that it's not relevant what's happening out there in the marketplace. So he understands that, but it's, it's going to be a, on a case by case basis. Well, I may be the exception on this call, but I, uh, I actually kind of like taxes. I think they give us a lot of great things that we enjoy in this, this fine country of ours. Although Mark Twain said the only difference between a, a taxidermist and a tax collector is a taxidermist just takes your skin or something to that effect. <laughs> Anyways, uh, do we have any questions from the audience on this? Anyone, maybe someone's dealing with something in particular. Maybe you guys are, are scrubbing a property for a client and, and wondering what this might look like down the road. You know, there's a lot of, of shifts with, with income and expenses on, on deals that we're looking at. So anybody has maybe something they want to share? I know there's a few also licensed appraisers on the call that are probably knee deep in this stuff. Uh, Paul and Blair, do you guys like to chime in anything before we get in our marketing session? I'd appreciate some feedback if you got it. 
I've got something. It's uh, Terry Torres, um, yes, 2020 CCIM president. And uh, my, my comment is just something that we've followed closely over the weeks uh, since COVID-19 became prevalent, so beginning in the month of March. And we've had a number of uh, webinars featuring Casey Conway, our CCIM national economist. And it's clear that uh, rent abatements and mortgage forbearances are having an effect on commercial properties, most of which are income properties. So we're talking about retail, industrial, apartments, and, and of course, office properties. And as rent abatements and mortgage forbearance and actually vacancies increase in these properties, it's going to affect the NOI, the net operating income. So even given that cap rates may stay the same and not change, as the NOI is reduced, the value of these properties is also going to be reduced and it will have an effect on valuations, not in 2020 because uh, taxes are definitely in arrears. Uh, actually, valuations in 2020 will be affected for investments, but maybe not for tax purposes. But definitely, we'll see uh, some effect from COVID-19 in 2021 with a reduction in valuations on commercial properties. And that would be just about across the board. Thanks for that comment, Terry. It's a pleasure to have President Torres on the, on the call. I would have worn my nicer flannel today if I knew you were joining. But thank you for your leadership during these time. I really appreciate it. Seen some You're great uh, perspective coming out from you. I'm in a t-shirt, Eric, which is the uniform of the day. So. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Anyone Eric, else have any comments to share? Yeah. I, hey, Eric. Uh, this is uh, Blair Lee. As far as I, I think to um, – to Mike's point, as far as, you know, talking about, you know, you know, your, and your poll, how will taxes, you know, increase or decrease? Well, the problem is, you know, COVID hit in March and, but all the data, cause it's always rear view looking. So for, for this coming year, it's the data as of January one of last year. So there's a good chance, unless something's changed, taxes will probably go up plus millage rates with uh, uh, you know municipalities being hurting for capital or for money uh, you could see some a, a pretty good pop and in increase in taxes uh, at least in 2021 and then we'll probably see a backwards or reduction the following year once the covid and the terry's point with uh, you know uh, lower NOIs, which if they transact will, will result in lower values, but it could be two years or 18 months before we feel lower taxes. Good point. Anyone else like to chime in? Got a minute or two left. Yes, yeah, uh, Paul Snitkin, Anderson and Carr. Um, yeah, just to jump on Blair's uh, comment, um, the city of West Palm mayor has already announced that, you know, taxes are going to be going up due to additional costs uh, due to COVID. So uh, we're already going to experience it probably, like Blair mentioned, as an arrears, 2021 will probably be seeing these increases. Okay. Awesome. Well, well thank you, everybody. We're going to move into our, uh, our marketing segment here, which Belinda will lead. I want to thank uh, Mike again for, for walking us through that today. Mike, if, if people have questions about this, you can see your, your contact information there on the screen. We'll also get his phone number out there. If people have questions, if they have clients uh, uh, want to take these bad battles on, they can call you and you can help direct them? Absolutely. Great. Thanks again, Michael. Go Gators. And Belinda, you. Uh, would you please lead us through uh, the marketing wants and haves? Need sure. Stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, um, Michael. Really appreciate that. Um, all right. Yeah. Let's get some deals done. Um, I didn't see Camille on the call, so we'll go on um, to uh, Adam. Adam. Hey, I'm here. Uh, real quickly, business has been in existence since 1963. Uh, 3,300 square foot facility located in beautiful sunny Oakland Park. Inventory building, business contracts. Everything for $725,000 is also a possibility of owner financing for somebody who's in the business. This is ideal for an E2 visa, uh, you know, immigrant. 
Uh, my number is 954-495-1818. Again, 954-495-1818. Business, building, inventory, and equipment. 725. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, um, Richard Abraham. I don't know if I saw Richard on here. Um, so we will go ahead and go keep going. Um, Terry. I didn't see Terry on here either. Um, Blair, go ahead. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Um, I've got a for in Jupiter Abacoa, um, mixed use property. We've got some nice commercial space. Um, you know, I was able to lease the space, but then also got a couple back, including um, going to be getting, if anyone's looking for a restaurant, you're going to be getting 3,125 square feet uh, as well uh, to the, I have, you know, five spaces ranging in size from 1,060 to 1,760 square feet. Owner's very realistic about what's going on. He's a deal maker. So if someone's looking to be in Jupiter, um, you know, give me a call because um, my owner's looking to do some deals. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see some... That's mine. Okay. Tyler, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I got uh, some residential land, uh, master site plan approved for 72 multifamily units. I would be broken up into three buildings, three stories tall with 24 units in each. Uh, this is a pretty rare opportunity, especially for Martin County with this sort of density on Canner Highway with traffic counts around 35,000. Um, seller's pretty realistic. Uh, so if you have anybody interested, just give me a call or shoot me an email. Okay, thank you. Okay, I know Jeff's not on the call. Joe, can you talk about this for Jeff? Yes, this is a wonderful complex uh, on the corner of California and uh, East uh, Port St. Lucie is next to a Walmart and next to a Walgreens. The place used to be rented by Payless, as you know, happy with Payless, they went out of business. The place is an open space ready for immediate occupancy, motivated seller, the price of $6,000 a month. That's including the cam and operating expenses available for immediate occupancy. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Joe. Okay, and this is Colin. I didn't see Colin on here, so we will go ahead and Keep going, uh, Michael. Hey there, gang. I'm coming to you from the uh, bridge of the Starship Enterprise this morning. Um, decided that would be a, a fun place to attend the Zoom meeting. And uh, I, I know you've seen this one before. This is a uh, property out in Zolfo Springs. So if you get off on uh, Beeline Highway heading west, it's about an hour and a quarter drive to get to uh, this property. The, uh, the homeowner or the property owner has uh, now told me that he would keep the ranch house in the barn himself and just sell off 140 acres for the development. So the price of the development land is a million dollars, which is $7,000 per acre uh, uh, or per lot. So uh, you can be in there with about, uh, oh, maybe something in the range of uh, 30 to 50 lots that are actually on the river. And then if you put a couple of lakes in uh, to, the, to the design of the property, you can have another 40 to 60 lots that are lake view uh, and really be able to sell them off and make some good profits. Uh, so this is for a developer who wants to sell lots or a, or a home builder who wants to build on your lot. Uh, give me a call on this one and, and I'm sure we can make a deal. Thank you, Michael. Okay, before we get into the wants, I know Paul Snitkin had something that um, he wanted to share, Paul. And, and if you can get his picture up on the, on the right hand side, uh, I think he's gonna show you a picture of his Paul, you still there? Paul, did you want to show that? Yeah, I got it. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, hi everybody. Paul Smith in again, Anderson and Carr. Um, yep, yeah, the hottest uh, area in West Palm Beach right now is South Dixie Highway. Uh, we had four properties there, uh, two have closed. One's under contract closing on the 28th. And then we have this new one, a new redevelopment project, which is located at 4801 South Dixie Highway. It's the old Bra Braille Club um, located right at the gateway of Phipps Park. It's a 0.6 acre site, so it could accommodate up to about a four to 5,000 square foot building with lots of parking. Uh, went on the market yesterday. We have an offer coming in today. So if you're interested, South Dixie's where to be and Paul Smith can suit a call. Thank you. What's the price? What's the price, Paul? 1.8 million, which is about 60 bucks a foot. Paul, can you put your uh, phone number and email in the chat? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Joe, did you did you have something else? You, I think you had. Um, yes, I have uh, something. I have a for lease, uh, 3,000 square feet. And guess, listen to me, these guys, is good for a church, a mosque, or any kind of house of faith for sinners. It's a special location for sinners. 3,000 square feet approved for a house of faith, church, synagogue, anything for the sinners to come and pay to God. The rent is $4,500 a month, available for immediate occupancy. 9661 West Semple Road, Coral Springs, Florida, 33065. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. All right, let's go on to some wants. Um, Terry's not on, so Michael, why don't you go ahead and, and talk about yours? Okay, back again. The uh, I've got my uh, my client that's looking for a meat processing location. Uh, he was he wants to be near I ninety five, anywhere from Pompano up through uh, Riviera Beach. Uh, Will lease. Um, anywhere from 12 to 20,000 square feet. It's gotta be able to be FDA uh, compliant. So it needs, uh, you know, pu public water and sewer and, and, uh, and the higher end uh, fi uh, fire suppression system. And if it's got already uh, existing uh, cooler and, and freezer, even, the, even better yet. Uh, if you've got somebody that, that has a existing business for sale that is a meat processing business, he'd even consider buying the business. So uh, they're trying to get something where they can move in first quarter of next year. So they've got to get moving fairly quickly. Will they buy? Yes, they will buy or lease. Let's talk. Okay. Hey, Sounds Michael, good. I'm sending you an email as well to follow up from our phone call the other day. Very good. Thank you. Let's keep going. Okay, Blair, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I've got um, some uh, couple restaurant users uh, looking for second gen space uh, and uh, either freestanding buildings um, or uh, or smaller ones as well. Um, I would say I initially I had West Palm to Stewart. That was just for one. I also have a guy who's been looking all over. South Florida, call it, um, aggressively looking for a second gen space. You know, he's looking to get in cheap, but he's real. He's got over 50 stores. So if you have any second gen spaces looking to sell or lease, uh, look me up. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Blair. Gus? Hey, Belinda. Hey, Gus. So, Joe, I think uh, Steve Einhorn and myself have been looking for a place to buy to absolve ourselves of all our sins. So I, I, I really think we should be able to do a deal. Steve, why don't you call Joe right after the meeting and let's get an LOI going on, the, on that building, right? So one of the guys on my team, it's actually not me, but one of the guys on my team does retail and he's looking for daycare space. He's actually running with two different uh, daycare operators, um, fortunately or unfortunately in the same area, uh, but they're looking for about 1,100 to 2,500 square feet with green space. And, you know, Hollywood to, to Fort Lauderdale, to Dania Beach, and plan to up to Plantation. So please give me a, actually an email, and I can just forward your, uh, your information to Kaid. Uh, he works on my team, uh, Gus Martinez at kw.com. Thanks, Belinda. All right. Thanks, Gus. All right. Um, I did not see Janet on the call. 
So I guess that, that wraps it up unless somebody else has something that they want to share. If I may. I want to share something. I have an off-market retail space that's around $5 million, uh, 3,500 square feet value add. If anybody knows uh, anybody who might be interested in this, please uh, do contact me. Okay. Where is that at now? Excuse me? What's the uh, location of that property? You need the springs, other side. Okay. Jamil, can you put your um, email or your um, phone number in the chat? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Linda? Yes. If I may, Steve Einhorn. Uh -huh. I'm looking for a failed subdivision anywhere in the state of Florida. If anybody knows a subdivision that went belly up, please contact me. I will put my uh, email and phone number in the chat. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve, it's Carola. Would you take townhomes or just single family? Uh, well, it, it's got to be single family, yeah. Single family, okay. Yeah, thank you. Linda, one uh, more thing. I'm sorry, Paul? Yeah, I uh, just want to let everyone know um, that um, Bob Banting and Anderson and Carr uh, has won the Small Business of the Year Award for the Chamber of Commerce for West Palm Beach. Nice. Congratulations. Uh, we, were among, we were among about 10, uh, 10 different businesses, and um, we got the word that, that uh, Anderson and Carr won it. So that's... Uh, Pretty good. They're going to give the award on a um, on a Zoom call on August twentieth. So I thought that was pretty good that one of our own has won something nice. Congrats, buddy. Yeah, well deserved. You. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. That's it. Well, there's not there something just real quick. Um, most of the people on the Zoom meeting today are independent contractors. So if you filed an extension for your business, it's due on September 15th, which is like a month away. And then the individual extensions are due on October 15th. So as you know, Charlie Solari at my firm is kind enough to do a complimentary tax meeting. Any way we can help uh, either you personally or professionally or your, or your clients, keep us in mind as a resource. My, I put in the chat, obviously, my phone number, my email address. So please keep us in mind. We're here for you if, we, if you need us. Thanks, Laurie. Thanks, Laurie. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? We are uh, we're in overtime. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for hanging on, and hopefully some business will come of this deal. Again, remember to uh, wash your hands and say your prayers because Jesus and germs are everywhere. Everybody. <laughs> stay, thanks uh, a lot, everybody out there. Everybody have a good week. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank okay. you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye, uh, thanks very for informative. Thank you.